students who are unable to wear them for reasons of age and special needs. Can you go to the next slide, Mr. Dolovich? Yes. Hold on. All right. Um, I think you jumped one. There we go. Yeah, let's see here. Oh, having minor technical difficulties. What would a virtual town hall meeting be without one? <laughs> Okay, so um, within the guidelines for screening and distancing, because I know many people are wondering about um, how we will how we will be screening and what are the requirements and what things we put in place around physical distancing. So um, the the county is articulating that students and fa or, and families and staff are are going to be required to self screen at home before entering the building. So um, if for whatever reason someone is not able to do that then we will be able to provide uh, screening, temperature screening um, on the site, um, both visual and uh, temperature. The, for physical distancing, um, you've probably, you, of course, you've heard about the six feet distance. So um, as practical, the, the county has said that desks should be placed six feet apart and arranged in a way that minimizes face-to-face -face contact. And I can say that our amazing custodial staff and facilities department have already um, been deep into uh, deep cleaning of the schools and already setting up classrooms for the possibility of coming back in person uh, and desk being six feet apart. So in terms of um, cohorts, so um, one of the requirements is going to be that um, anytime a school returns to in-person learning, the cohorts uh, in class cannot be as large as they used to be, cannot be 32 per class, and in fact really are, uh, need to be 12 or less. And um, so as practical, students should remain in the same space in groups as small and as consistent as possible. And so when it is not possible, such as in uh, secondary, high school, and junior high, that's when face coverings and limited uh, group gatherings are a higher priority. Mr. Dolowich will explain a little bit more of that. You'll see that in, um, in the, the schedule when he, we get to that. Um, in, a different, in, in addition, there's guidelines around the length of time. So cohorts, um, maintaining cohorts uh, stable for at least four weeks is a critical part of the guidelines. And then if new students enroll, they, can, they of course can be placed in an already established cohort upon enrollment. And then lastly, uh, part of the guidelines around cohorts is the teacher student movement and rotations. So what is articulated is that teachers will be able to teach different cohorts of children as long as they are practicing physical distancing protocols. For the younger kids, keeping a physical distance from, from teachers will be difficult. And so that's why um, the, the idea of stable cohorts, small groups of 12 that don't rotate or change is, um, is what's expected for the younger grades. So those are the, uh, the current Alameda County guidelines for how to conduct in-person learning. Um, there is, uh, we, we, we will continue to share these and um, any changes to these as, um, as that occurs. And with that, I wanna turn it back over to Mr. Dolowich, who's gonna talk more about um, some of the specifics around um, what we're recommending and what's been recommended by the Instructional Planning Committee. Thank you, Dr. Triplett. As many may be aware, the district has five functioning committees in preparation for planning to reopen. Uh, the committee that I help co-chair and lead is titled the Instructional Planning Committee, and we've met a number of times. Um, some of the recommendations include a differentiated approach for elementary and secondary schools, and I'll speak to that momentarily, providing an opportunity for our moderate intensive SDC and mental health students to return to consistent in-person schedule as early as possible. And it's a point of emphasis to reopen schools only when it is absolutely safe to do so, both for our students and for our staff. And this includes components that I'll speak to uh, with our phases for reopening that include available PPE, cleaning, physical space, and transportation capacity for students to campuses. Ed Services then recommends a phased reopening approach um, contingent on safety and health conditions, first and foremost. And I'll speak to the nuances of phased reopening um, in an upcoming slide and a tiered approach to in-person instruction so that in-person services are offered to students 
on top of a high quality learning program, a virtual academy, and the virtual academy will be a component later in this presentation. And finally, a point of emphasis and a focus on equity, equity for students within special education, students experiencing mental health hardships, early childhood, transition grades, newcomers, and students that have been most significantly impacted by learning loss. This somewhat busy slide is a uh, phases of reopening slide that um, is a flow chart that can help show and explain our thinking with respect to reopening in person. And if you look at the very top, the title California Department of Education recommends, we are following state guidelines. And under the state guidelines, we're following Alameda County guidelines. And then ultimately as a local education agency, the district and our board of education will decide and determine what the schedule will look like for August 13th. So if the California Department of Education or Alameda County recommends no, in other words, the conditions and the number of cases in the state and county are simply too high and it's unsafe, then we follow that chart over to the right and you can see that we would be in distance learning for August 13th. We would in effect start in distance learning if we did not have the green light. However, if the state, county, and our board determine that, determines that it's safe to reopen, then we would look at the five categories below, uh, specifically cases at school and within Newark, the PPE necessary, do we have the sufficient and requisite numbers on each campus to provide a safe environment for our staff and our students, contact tracing, physical capacity, and of course, cleaning. And so for each of those, you can see that we would monitor daily whether we have the su sufficient supplies, whether numbers are rising or decreasing, and so on and so forth. And after a distance learning option, you can see to your right that phase two includes a hybrid. And in this case, a hybrid is gonna be the detailed schedule that I'm gonna offer next. It is of course uh, very unlikely without a safe vaccine that we would reach phase three or full. So we will proceed through the phases of reopening and make safe evidence-based decisions based on science and data. Before you is an example of the hybrid schedule. We're all familiar with um, with the distance learning schedule that we were that we had to go into in the spring. And if the numbers are unsafe, we've been working to provide a clear plan and support our staff if, in fact, the conditions do not allow us to return the hybrid. But if they allow us to return the hybrid, a few important takeaways from this visual are the following. One, we want to have consistent and common language for our families. Newark has inherent advantages as a tight-knit community and a community that can support one another with one junior high and a comprehensive flagship high school. And we want our students and especially siblings to be grouped in the same group for logical and obvious reasons. Group A would meet on Tuesday and Thursday in person. Group B would meet on Wednesday and Friday. In a hybrid model, and you can see TK through six at the top portion, and then an example of phase one only of grades seven through 12, and the latter half, the bottom portion. In each of these models, Monday is a protected day where students and families receive a weekly template. And we wanna work with our NTA partners and support our staff to be able to provide staff meetings, prepare accord accordingly, attend professional development meetings, and early in Monday morning, provide each and every student an expectation and a concrete weekly template so that they know what lessons and activities, they know what to expect. This was a, a big takeaway from our first survey with the community. And so we wanna make sure that we get this right at the start of every week and try to demystify distance learning. So that would be a time known as asynchronous learning when the students are receiving that template and conducting activities or listening to an already recorded video chat, for example. 
uh, in these models, fewer students are on campus. So we would effectively cut our student population in half. It allows for more thorough cleaning since there's only one group each day. Um, and you can see with grade seven through 12 that the secondary design team recommended that we remain with six traditional classes. So students in the junior high and high school levels would receive six classes. And then you can see Tuesday through Friday that they would follow that initial schedule for group A and group B. Again, Tuesday and Thursday, Wednesday and Friday. And we have a phase two at the secondary level when they would meet more frequently and have an, an extended full school day. The secondary level below takes into account that students would receive a lunch. However, teachers would have an afternoon to continue with instruction or prepare and provide feedback for our students. What you see before you is the virtual academy. And with the virtual academy that we are looking to design and partner with our, with our labor partners, the virtual academy is an idea that is offered for all of our students and families if and when we are in a hybrid model and students and families do not feel comfortable returning with in-person instruction, we understand, want to be responsive and we want to keep students and families enrolled in Newark Unified. Therefore, the Virtual Academy takes you into account offering credentialed teachers to be able to provide instruction, remote instruction live, as well as activities uh, similar to the weekly template where students are completing projects or assignments on their own. And a Virtual Academy um, offers the opportunity, again, for students and families to have a teacher with them and if uh, students did return hybrid in person, and we understand that some students and families have discomfort with that at this time, we would be offering enrollment online in order to gauge interest and provide an op opportunity for students and families um, to be with us. And you can see here, it's a combination of lesson components and elements. It differs for TK6 through grades seven, tw seven through 12 but it does include small group work. It inc includes work and projects on their own. And uh, finally, it also includes instruction with a teacher. Our decision-making timeline, you can see before you, we wanna be committed to continued and improved communication and responsiveness. And to this end, you can see six important upcoming events, both in July and August. July 14th is our special board meeting where we will prevent a updated plan such as this and the board will have an opportunity to provide discussion and feedback. August 6th is the second board meeting upcoming. July 23rd is two weeks from today and the superintendent's team would like to again offer a virtual town hall meeting in order to provide continued updates and increased responsiveness with respect to the upcoming reopening of the school year. August 3rd through the 10th, we expect sites to communicate directly with families with respect to supplies, with respect, with respect to Chromebooks, and with respect to preparation for the beginning of the school year. August 10th, teachers return. And finally, on August 13th, students return and the academic year begins. And so we will be starting the school year on time and we're looking forward to providing a model that supports our students and families. As we move forward together, a few salient take takeaways include the aforementioned weekly template for teachers and families. This is an opportunity for teachers to work collaboratively and communicate weekly at the start of each week regarding tasks, projects, and expected outcomes. And this is an opportunity for students and families to have a very clear picture of what is expected of students. We wanna be able as much as possible to prioritize teachers and free up teachers to do more small group instruction. We wanna be responsive to our families 
that do not feel comfortable sending their students back on August 13th if we did indeed start with a hybrid model and therefore we would offer a virtual academy TK through 12. We want to be very clear about taking a student-centered approach. The pandemic has affected all of us, including our social emotional learning, as well as our mental health. And we wanna prioritize the mental health, support our staff, but most importantly, support our students and develop a new graduate profile of what we expect our newer graduate to be with 21st century skills and a component for an internship. And finally, we want to be able to recognize and honor the Newark expertise that lies within. We have absolutely fantastic and outstanding experienced teachers, teachers that can support one another, that can collaborate, and we wanna create a training of trainers model so that teachers are able to set up their classroom remotely if that's their choice and they wanna do that in July or August and do so in a collaborative manner and they can lean on one another. And so we would have teacher leaders help us lead the way. We wanna thank you for your input as we're about to open it up to chat questions uh, for the virtual town hall meeting. And again, we'll be offering a second virtual town hall meeting July 23rd. Please know both at the end of this presentation, there will be an English and Spanish survey provided in the chat box. And there will also be an English and Spanish survey, the same one uploaded on our website. And so we can use that data in order to troubleshoot and problem solve and support the board in making the safest and best decision possible for our Newark students and families. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dolowich. And uh, thank you to the team who has been doing all of this work, putting this together. Um, so a couple things uh, before we uh, take questions from the chat. Um, and many people have, um, have sent messages that the YouTube uh, channel is not up and running. Um, it sounds like there is a technological glitch there. So please know that uh, this is, we're recording this whole presentation and it'll all be available online on the website tomorrow. So anybody who was not able to get in here um, now will be able to see it and also be able to um, complete the surveys tomorrow. Um, we're also um, planning on having a Spanish translation put up on the web as well. Um, the other thing I just wanted to state, I think we, we neglected to mention, is um, any concerns around uh, accessibility for um, the internet and um, computer use. So I'm really delighted to hear that, the, um, that we are one-to-one -one across the district. So that means that any student who needs a Chromebook to take home will have that available for them. Uh, in addition, um, the team had purchased um, hotspots. So any family that is, uh, does not have uh, Wi-Fi access at home will be able to support with that as well because um, it's imperative that all of our kids um, have access online. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Ms. Castillon has been monitoring the chat and she's gonna uh, mention or lift up one at a time some of the uh, questions that are coming up and then um, we'll do our best to answer them. Ms. Castillon. Thank you, yes, thank you, Dr. Triplett. Um, so I'm going through the questions. The first one we have here is, my son is attending a special education program at Music Elementary. Do you make a specific plan for a special education? And the answer is absolutely. All students with individual education plans and that are a part of our SDC programs have um, individualized plans and we, we design them with um, a collaborative team, including teachers, administrators, support staff, and participants, uh, parent, guardians, advocates um, to, meet, to meet the needs of our students. Terrific. And I think we'll, um, we'll have more information and details about those structures at the, um, the next town hall. Is that right, Mr. Dolowich? Correct. Great. Um, I do, before you go on, Ms. Castellon, I just got an update that the YouTube uh, channel is working. So people are on there and are able to, to see the live stream. So thank you to the IT team. Awesome. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is when will an actual when will an actual decision actually be made on how students will re how the schools will reopen? Will it be in the next NUSD meeting on 14th? 
Great. So um, it uh, we, we will be presenting what we've presented tonight with some uh, changes based on your feedback on Tuesday on the 14th. We won't, I do not expect that we will have a concrete definitive um, uh, answer to whether or not we're in distance learning or in the hybrid model on the 14th. And I know that's really frustrating, but the honest, uh, honestly, um, I think we should expect and be prepared to have to um, pivot between distance learning and in-person learning um, throughout the fall. So um, my hope is that um, as we get closer to um, August, and hopefully on the 23rd, although I don't wanna make any promises, that uh, the, the county and the state will have um, more information about, um, about the direction of the pandemic. And uh, we hopefully will be able to make a more definitive call um, at that point. But um, what, what we really wanna communicate is, and, and, and make sure everyone is understanding, is the, um, how we will pivot between distance learning and hybrid, um, a hybrid blended learning model um, as, it, as, as the case, case needs. Thank you. Um, next question, how will you go about deciding which children will be able to enter in-person schooling with the reduced class numbers? You want me to start, Mr. Delowich, and then you can uh, feel free to, um, to chime in. Um, I'll just say, I'll just say that um, we are really um, we are really prioritizing equity, and the students that have had the greatest challenges um, are the students that we really want to prioritize for um, for in-person learning. But our goal is that um, every student is able to do some degree of in-person learning in the fall. Did you want? Can you add anything to that, Mr. Dolowich? Absolutely. Um, if we are able to offer the virtual academy, we've um, already conducted a survey and over 20% of our families have expressed interest. And if we do in fact offer the hybrid model with in-person instruction at any time in the fall, um, that effectively divides the student population um, in half. You have a group A and a group B. And coupled with the uh, students that would not be present for a virtual academy, uh, we're looking at approximately 40% of students on campus at any time drastically uh, reducing the total uh, mass gathering. Okay, thank you. The next question um, in regard to that, they're asking what would the time, what would be the time? Will groups be in school all day or half day? That's a great question. Oh, you're muted there. Oh, sorry. Um, so, um, I, Ms. Dolowich, I'll let you again answer in more in depth. But I, I think um, at this point, we are exploring different um, different times, and um, uh, in, including the fact that um, it, it we probably want to avoid um, every student coming to school all at the same time in the morning or being dismissed at the same time, if possible. Just because of the, um, just be, because it in, increases the the possibility of um, of um, um, infection. Um, however, none of that uh, we haven't finalized any of that because we really want to make sure that we are working with our union partners and creating an agreement with them. So um, none of that is final. Thank you. Just to echo the agreement around um, working with our labor partners, of course. Um, and to give an example for our families and our parents out there, uh, what we discussed and outlined June 18th, for instance, with staggered arrival and dismissal times, TK through one could be 8 a.m., um, grades two and three, 8.30 a.m., and grades four through six, 9 a.m., and dismissal times would be similarly staggered so that parents and guardians picking them up would not have to deal with the total population that's on campus at that time. Similarly, our junior high, seventh, grade seven and eight would be separated, 8 a.m. for grade seven, 8.30 for um, grade eight, and then grades nine and 10 arrive at 8 a.m. and grades 11 and 12 arrive at 8.30. So trying to um, adhere to the county and state guidelines and reduce uh, gatherings on campus. Thank you. The next one, I applaud your efforts and plan. If parents slash kids are not comfortable due to being high risk group, 
Can the students remain fully virtual rather than hybrid? Thank you for that. Yeah, that's really important. So uh, absolutely, if a family or a student um, it has a situation where they're not comfortable or not able at this point to be um, in person at all, then uh, we absolutely are able to, um, to provide full distance learning for that student and family. And that is part of what the virtual academy is that Mr. Dolowich referred to. Thank you. Um, next question, what will virtual academy look like? Will a teacher be logged in with the child during the whole session or more like distance learning as we experienced in April slash May? So that's a combination um, similar to the hybrid where the remote learning would be live. Um, students would be in small groups with a credentialed teacher. And so they would be receiving that instruction in real time, multiple times a week. There would also be, as I mentioned earlier, the educational term asynchronous learning, where there would be clear expectations regarding projects, assignments, um, and, and assessments. And so in, to that end, it would be a combination um, similar to, the, um, to what the um, participant mentioned. Thank you. Um, the next one, when will the Virtual Learning Academy be open for enrollment? We, we are actively working with IT and um, our, our hope um, is first and foremost predicated on agreements with our labor partners. And once there is an agreement with respect to the Virtual Academy and the logistics that it entails with teachers as well as with students, um, then we would offer it um, hopefully in a timeline over the next 10 days, 10 business days. Um, it is worth mentioning that at the end of the survey that's provided in the chat and also on our website, that there is a specific question in order to capture data for the virtual academy so that we can begin compiling numbers now. Thank you. Next question, will elementary students be allowed to play on the playground? Uh, that, that's a good question. I, I actually don't wanna, um, I don't wanna, um, over speak there. So I, I, we would have to go back and, and find out the details of that from the um, from the county. But um, I would anticipate that um, any any play on a playground would really we want to make sure that we are doing proper cleaning and sanitizing. And so um, we'll go back to the county and, and get their guidelines on that. Thank you. Prior to reopening for in-class activity, how will you ensure the cleanings, uh, sanitizing tactics and materials are safe and documented? I'm sorry, Mr. Castillo, could you repeat that, please? Yeah. Um, prior to reopening for class activity, how will you ensure the cleaning san slash sanitizing tactics and materials are safe and documented for the Great. reopening? Yeah, so um, we are planning on following a really strict protocols for, for cleaning. And again, all of that will be based on the guidelines from the county. And um, I expect that before opening, we will review all of those protocols with um, all of our staff. And, um, and then we will have ongoing monitoring to ensure that those protocols are being followed. Going through the questions here, I'm getting them a lot, so bear with me. <laughs> uh, let's see. I did see one about as you're looking, Ms. Castellona. I saw a question about grades because I know um, um, in the spring that was uh, it was more of a credit, no credit, and um, so we will return to grading, whether it's distance learning or in person. Um, we'll have grading in the fall, and then I also saw a question about um, high school sports. So um, I know that there, um, the, the Federation, the, the CIF, and our, um, our athletic department are currently putting together a plan. And um, I hope that we'll be able to share that with you um, in the town hall session on the 23rd. And I, would, I would just add, since we have a phenomenal athletic director at the high school with Coach K, that um, we're really trailblazing with athletics and of course, 
safety is first and foremost, but we understand um, how influential and impactful um, athletics can be in a student's life. And so that's, that's definitely gonna be taken into account. Um, I see one here. What if a parent opts to do virtual academy and wants to transfer over to hybrid learning? Will it be allowed? Great. Do you wanna take that Mr. Dolovich? Sure. So, and feel free to add on. Um, the premise with the virtual academy is that the students are in it for the entirety of the trimester or semester. Um, it, is, it is not designed to be fluid and go in and out. And one of the foundational um, reasons why is because if we do um, go from hybrid to distance learning, we simply can't have students exit and re-enter um, within the span of the same quarter or within a trimester. Dr. Triplett? Uh, I think that's, that's right on. Okay. Regarding staggered start times in your example, how would we accommodate siblings at the same school with different start times supervision? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I would say that's a great question. And mm -hmm. we obviously work very closely with our site principals. So gathering the input from our principals with respect to the appropriate stagger times that work for our community. Uh, what I provided was simply an example, not set in stone. Um, but with respect to siblings, I think that would require the input from the family as well as the principal on site, if they're both at the same campus, um, to be able to try to tailor needs to accommodate the family. I think I had some internet issues there. Um, going through the questions. What will be the protocol if COVID is in a class or on campus? Yeah, so um, the, the county has created some, um, some different guidelines around that. And um, it's really based on, uh, I was reviewing them earlier. It's uh, really based on a case by case situation. And, and what happens is um, anytime a, a case is identified, then um, the county, we, re we, we let the county know. Um, they maintain absolute confidentiality. Um, they don't take um, any sort of, um, uh, they don't record social security numbers or anything like that or documentation status. But they, um, they then support to identify what the, the, the possible um, uh, contagion could have been. And, uh, and then we, we follow just, um, um, uh, oh, I'm blanking on the term now, um, the, the tracing. Contact tracing. Contact tracing, thank you. Then, then what we do is um, the county helps to follow, for us to follow um, a process of contact tracing. So identifying um, who, uh, a given individual has been in contact with and then notifying those people so that we can ensure that that people um, that are uh, are um, uh, sheltering and um, are not returning to school if they have uh, been exposed. Um, another question, if children need more help like IEPs, how will the access be given to the children to complete any homework given through this period? Will there be more access to get the help for homework given? So embedded um, within the plan that, that we provided and Dr. Triplett um, emphasized equity. And we do want to pro prioritize certain uh, student subgroups, including students with disabilities, students with IEPs. If conditions do allow for a hybrid, um, the return for special education students would be a top priority. And we would try to maximize the number of days there on campus in appropriate small groups for in-person instruction. And we would absolutely um, work our best to support staff, support the principal and support the family in meeting the, those students' needs. Um, I think uh, without sugarcoating it, we all know that the, the last three months um, threw us a curveball and really provided significant challenges for um, significant sub subgroups. And so as we work throughout the summer, we're looking to design plans and protocols that support our students 
that are most in need, um, primarily students with disabilities. Um, there was another question earlier. Will each school have a nurse on site? Um, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure. I don't want to answer out of turn on that one. Um, I will. I'll, I'll, we'll go back and um, and find the answer to that. I'm not sure if I missed any. I'm being asked more than once. So I'm still going through the list. Uh, I will say, um, and, and I think that's a good point, Dr. Triplett, so that we can research and, and come back to the um, healthcare practitioners, that we have a fantastic uh, district nurse in Agnes Lopez, who is in regular contact with Alameda County um, Public Health Department and is um, on all of our weekly calls as uh, a management team with respect to updates and protocols. So I have a reverse question from the one earlier, the one how we asked if they opt for virtual, can they go back to hybrid? This one is if they opt for hybrid, can they go back to a virtual academy? So if they start out with a hybrid, can they transfer into virtual, all virtual academy? So two things to note. One, this is still contingent on agreements with our labor partners as we work to design the virtual academy. I think that needs to be said outright. And, and two, um, unfortunately, the answer is no. It's not a fluid situation. Um, if we design the virtual academy and allow for reevaluation, that would be at either a trimester or semester mark. And that may be a possibility if a family or student wants to reassess then, but not before then. If a child is out due to illness, could they piggyback on the virtual teaching platform? So I think we're gonna deal with every situation on a case by case basis, along with our student services department. And um, sometimes that includes independent study in the past when families need to travel for personal reasons um, or with respect to uh, remote learning, if the student is able to continue, um, and for example, our district is in distance learning, then they could effectively remain with their class or cohort with that same teacher, um, not needing to transfer to a virtual academy. So it's very case specific. Without more details, it's hard to provide a definitive answer. What about an on-campus after-school program? Will they be allowed to run to support those children who will be in hybrid learning. My daughter's campus has the think the program Think. Right. I did hear from the county on a call this morning that um, that uh, they are creating plans for both athletics and um, and after school programs. And um, my understanding is it'll follow very similar guidelines to the um, to the the regular school day. So um, part of it will be that um, students will need to stay in a cohort. Um, and um, one challenge will be that a student most likely would not be able to do both a sport and do other athletic, or sorry, a sport and also do other uh, after school programs um, because then it would be, um, we'd be crossing uh, co different cohorts. So we, we will have more, um, more information about that in the, in the upcoming weeks. I see a number of questions on there, Ms. Castillon, about childcare. I mean, yeah, um, that was my next one, actually. <laughs> will after school childcare be available? If, and if so, will it only be on campus days based on cohort? So we're currently um, thinking through the childcare options. Um, so I don't have any information right now on that, but that's definitely something that we want to um, work through and, and, and iron out. Thank you. Um, and I'm not sure if you answered this one yet. I may be repeating it and I apologize if I am, but it says, hi, I'm not sure if my question was answered. If we choose virtual academy and our child receives speech therapy or some special services, is the academy still an option and would they receive the same service virtually? That's a really good question. I saw a, a couple different um, 
uh, similar questions on there. So just to be real, um, re receiving all of the services in IAP is much more challenging um, in a distance setting. And um, so we would need to take it on a case by case basis. It is why we're prioritizing students um, with IEPs to, um, to, to have access to the in-person learning. Um, but again, we, we definitely would wanna um, treat that on a case by case basis because anything, any service that we could provide in a distance setting, of course, we want to do everything we can to, to do that. For virtual learning, will all instructional material be electronic, hard copy, or both? So great question. Um, students and families that join the virtual academy would still be a part of Newark Unified and would therefore receive the appropriate supplies, i.e. textbooks, workbooks, supplementary materials. Um, however, we know in this day and age with technology and remote learning that a large part of that learning would also be electronic, which is why um, Dr. Triplett made a point to emphasize addressing the digital divide and continued distribution with Chromebooks and hotspots, because that would be the primary form or, or medium for instruction. However, students would have the textbooks and supplies offered from the district as well. If we are doing distance learning, are we still dealing with our attendance school? So if you distance learning or virtual academy? Um, distance, distance learning. They yes, ask if we're doing distance learning, are we still dealing with our attendance school? So the difference between the two distance learning, the answer is yes. You're still affiliated and associated with your school of residence and you're part of a cohort with a teacher from that school. The virtual academy, we're looking again with our labor partners to organize and centralize at the district level. Got it. Um, let's see. Can you elaborate on the high school schedule of six classes? How long will each class run and how long is the break between each class? Who will clean the classroom and materials before another class comes into the classroom? Would you like me to jump in there? Yeah, thanks. Um, sure. Um, so we're, we're uh, really grateful to have Miss um, Rangel um, as our principal at Newark Memorial High School. And she worked with the secondary design team that included specialists, staff members, and teachers from secondary schools throughout Newark. Um, with respect to the schedule, they designed a phase one and a phase two. The phase one that I shared briefly, and this, um, that presentation will be made available on our website. The phase one is a modified instructional day. And the modified instructional day um, attempts to limit the number, uh, the amount of movement and transitions that students are having. Um, it also um, includes lunch for the students. However, the students then have that lunch off campus and the staff um, continue with remote instruction, provide um, academic feedback or plan and collaborate based on the day of the week. Um, and students go home at an earlier time in phase one. They still have all six classes and they're in a group A and group B Tuesday through Friday. Um, the difference with phase two then at the secondary schools with junior high and, high and the two high schools is that the day becomes a complete instructional day as it did, as it would previously. And so those six classes um, would follow a traditional um, bell schedule um, with the changes of the staggered uh, arrival and dismissal times. Um, and they would still have all six classes lunch would be on campus in phase two based on the conditions and we know about the numbers with COVID that it makes a lot of sense again to prioritize the safety of our students and staff and so uh, if and when we do return in a hybrid model at the secondary school level those six classes would be modified with the instructional day to end earlier. Thank you. So I have a few questions. Um, if you can elaborate more on the difference between distance learning and virtual academy. 
I've got about three or four that came in here in the last minute or two. Sure. And I'll, you want me to begin and then I can uh, allow you to, to, to weigh in, Dr. Triplett? Or sure. would you like to start? No, you go ahead. Um, well, one of the primary differences between uh, the virtual and the distance is that the distance, as Dr. Triplett mentioned, we need to be able to pivot. If conditions um, dictate that we're allowed to go hybrid, then based on that flow chart, we're gonna prioritize in-person instruction because we know that's best for relationships between teachers and students. If it's unsafe, we're gonna start in distance learning. That very well may happen within the span of the same quarter or the same semester. In that case, the virtual academy allows students whose families and students do not feel comfortable returning to know that they're still having a teacher provide instruction, they're receiving academic grades that are part of a transcript, and they remain a part of NUSD. And so the difference, part of that difference is the lack of fluidity between the two models. Uh, but in both models, they have a credentialed Newark Unified teacher. Thank you. Thank you. Question in regards to Chromebooks. Will siblings in the same household still need to share Chromebooks as we did in March? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, we we are we really want to prioritize that every student has um, has a Chromebook. Um, but of course, if um, if there's a family that uh, where there is a Chromebook, then um, uh, we're going to do everything we can to get one to each student. But um, but we will need to prioritize first uh, a family a household that doesn't have um, any any Chromebook. So our hope is that uh, the hope is yes. But, uh, but first and foremost, we're gonna make sure that every family has, has access. Okay, and I'm going back through to see if I... I think we have time for one more and then we should wrap up. Let's see. This one, will NUSC teachers and any other staff who are high risk be given the options to teach virtually? The question that just came up. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, really don't wanna speak out of turn on that one because um, it's really contingent on uh, the agreement and the MOU with, um, with uh, the teachers union. So uh, we, we will be able to answer that um, soon, we hope. Um, but um, but it really depends on the agreement that's reached. Okay. So any questions? Um, I have some people asking if any questions that were not answered here, um, how can they be answered? Excellent. Yep. Yeah. So um, we, uh, we we're going to collect up all these. I want to thank everybody for their for their questions and participating tonight. Um, we'll collect up all the questions and then we'll um, we'll collate them and and uh, do our best to uh, create responses that we could post. On the uh, on the website for all um, for all the questions in, in groups, of course, um, in, in sort of in, in thematic groups. So um, I think we're almost out of time, um, and so I did just want to wrap up. And number one, thank the entire team that um, is supported tonight. Um, there's a whole bunch of people in the background that did amazing work to put this together. Uh, I want to remind everybody that we will, um, we will be uh, meeting, uh, having a board meeting on Tuesday. Please tune in. Um, and then also that our next town hall will be on the 23rd, where we'll have even more updates and more information about, about um, a whole host of um, um, aspects of the fall reopening. Um, and then lastly, um, please do fill out the survey. It's short, but it really would be helpful for us to give us a sense of, um, of your concerns and, um, and your priorities. And um, I look forward to meeting all of you, not just virtually, but in person this school year. I am so excited to be here in Newark. I am, I, in my five days here, I've been struck by the amazing people um, and the amazing potential of this, this district. And so I am really optimistic and positive that uh, we're going to achieve great things, not just this year, but into the future. So thank you, have a great night, and, um, and we'll see you soon.